Hello, this is the uh, video that I've prepared to uh, present to the uh, CHM 146 Advanced Chemistry 2 students uh, to introduce you to Chapter 11 material. You should be watching this after taking uh, the first exam of the semester. Uh, the video may end up stopping at various points and then being merged uh, so that hopefully it's all one big package for you to watch. Uh, but for those of you who were present when we made the lab video, you understand that the camera sometimes is stopped recording so I'm going to try to keep an eye on that and uh, see how far along we get and break up the material into different chunks and then I'll take care of merging the, uh, the videos for you uh, prior to posting it. So hopefully what you're about to watch is one nice uh, entire video but we'll see how it turns out. So chapter 11 now, we're ready to turn our attention to the other phases of matter. We've already studied gases uh, quite a bit, learned uh, several gas laws uh, that govern the behavior and describe the behavior of gases. Uh, in chapter 11, we are going to look at how the other phases of matter behave to some extent. But before we can do that, we have to answer a very interesting question, which is that now that we know a little bit about uh, temperature and its relationship to energy, I would hope that there's a, a few questions in the back of your mind like, well at a given room temperature for example, the room that I'm standing in right now, all of the objects have the same temperature. And we, and we did this with heat capacity. We talked about how the table felt different from the le de leg of the desk that was metal when we grabbed it. But everything was at the same temperature. And temperature is, you know, an approximation of how much energy is present in a system. So, you know, our table has the same amount of energy as the air has in it, as a glass of water has in it. So, if everything has the same energy, same amount of motion associated with it approximately, why are we seeing different phases of matter exist at that same temperature? In other words, what is it that allows the oxygen and nitrogen in this room right now to be in the gas phase and acting the way that we know gases do, but yet the majority of water that's in this room would be present as a liquid. Some is vaporized and we know there's humidity in the air, uh, so there's a little bit of water vapor, but the majority is in the liquid phase. And then yet many other things are present in the solid phase. A piece of copper would be present as a sop solid, for example. Right? So what's controlling uh, or what's different about those species, those three different substances, a gas like oxygen, a compound like water, and a metal like uh, copper, that's causing the three different phases to exist even though they're all at the same temperature. And the, 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 the quick and easy answer to that question is that phase is determined, phase of matter is determined by a, a number of factors. Okay. Um, underlying those are the temperature, of course, although we've just talked about how all of the objects in a room like this have the same temperature, okay? Uh, the atmospheric pressure can play a role in this, all right? Uh, but the big one, the one that we want to learn about in, in uh, today's lecture is the intermolecular force of attraction. I guess you could think of these first two as temperature and pressure as things that would be trying to pull a substance apart or um, in some sense. They're the energy available, uh, especially from the temperature. This is what's allowing the energy to, quote, pull molecules of a substance apart from one another. Okay? Now I don't mean to break the molecules. 
Imagine reaching your hand into a bag of gummy bears, for example, and sometimes the gummy bears are stuck to each other. Your hand is sort of like the temperature. You're pulling gummy bears off of that collection, right? You know, you're not pulling the gummy bear apart and breaking it down into the different sugar uh, components and the color components. You're simply separating one gummy bear from the aggregate group that's present there. Right? That's the, the different view that we have of our phases of matter. In a solid, our molecules are very tightly packed and they're all in contact with each other. In a liquid, our molecules are still touching one another, but there's a little more space. This is a bit of an exaggeration the way I'm doing it but they are a little more spread out in most cases. Uh, so there's a little bit of more room present in there. And then of course in the gas phase, our molecules are completely separated from each other. And temperature is the major player in what moves a substance from this solid to liquid to the gas or, or vice versa. But working against the temperature, and perhaps the pressure, is this thing, this new t thing that I'm going to introduce today called the intermolecular force of attraction. Right? So when you reach into a bag of gummy bears, they stick, they're sticking to each other. But when you reach into a bag of pretzels, the pretzels don't naturally stick to each other. There's no attraction between them that causes them to cluster up in the bag. So there's something different about gummy bears from pretzels. And it might be a little harder for you to pull free one of the gummy bears, whereas the pretzels might just naturally come, come apart very easily from each other. So that stickiness, that tendency of the foods to want to stick together would be the sort of the intermolecular force of attraction. So these intermolecular forces of attraction are forces that exist between molecules that hold the molecules to one another. Okay. Again, we want to be very clear. These are not the chemical bonds that we're talking about. All right. I'm not talking about the, the chemical bonds that are holding carbon atoms to oxygen atoms. I'm talking about what might stick one complete molecule to another complete molecule. Right. Without getting too far ahead of myself, let me, let me draw a water molecule. Okay, So we've got a single water molecule. What would cause this water molecule by itself, it would be in the gas phase. What would cause it to then stick to another water molecule, in other words? And we'll often represent this attraction between molecules as a dotted or dashed line. So the black, if you could see the difference in colors, the black dotted lines that I've drawn here would be the attractions between two different water molecules. So these are the intermolecular forces of attraction that we're interested in. And there are several different varieties of intermolecular forces, some which are very strong and some which are very weak. The IMFs, intermolecular forces of attraction, just for, for short, IMF, okay? Um, the, the strong IMFs tend to, but not always, they tend to lead to solids, okay? Uh, substances that exist in the solid phase, right? Whereas weak intermolecular forces lead to gases and liquids. Okay? There is not as much attraction between the molecules, therefore it's a little easier at normal conditions that we're used to, uh, to have those substances pull apart and exist in the liquid and the gas phase. All right? So that's just a, a real, real first uh, first level approximation right there. Stronger intermolecular forces lead to solids usually. Weak intermolecular forces lead to gases and liquids. There are other variables that play a role in this, of course, and I'll mention those as, as we come across them. 
So let's figure out and let's learn a little bit about what the different intermolecular forces of attraction are. The names that we have for the different intermolecular forces of attraction come from terms that we've already used in chemistry, particularly when it comes to the types of bonds that might be present, okay, um, and, the, and uh, what's going on with polarity and non-polarity in molecules. Some topics that we cover in chapter 9 uh, in, in our textbook that we're using uh, in chemistry 1. So if you want some refresher on some of these uh, topics like Vesper and on bond polarity, I would direct you to, to flip through chapter 9 uh, and look back into your Chem 1 notes on, on those topics. Okay. I'm going to do a quick refresher though. So remember that uh
Okay, so we've just considered uh, now the first most simple case of a uh, symmetric molecule. I could draw a few others uh, out for you if we'd like. Uh, I mean an AX3 would have A and then the three X's evenly distributed at 120 degree bond angles. And again, it wouldn't matter if these uh, dipole moments point out or in, but when we would uh, use vectors to add each of those three dipole moments, what we would see is that the component of these two that points down would add to, to counteract or uh, cancel this one pointing up. And then the same thing would happen in each of the three, uh, along each of the three bonds here. Even when we move to three dimensions, this would still happen. If we had an AX4 and we used our sort of wedge and dash system to show us this, it would still work out that the dipole moment of the one pointing up would cancel against the three, the components of the three that point down and away from it. And that would work for all four of the bonds, or five or six, in whichever case you get to. So anytime the molecule has this complete degree of symmetry, it's going to be a nonpolar molecule. But when we can break that symmetry, that's when we get to nonpolar molecules that will then be polar. So there are many cases where we have non-polar molecules. But to make life quick and easy, it is not 100% of the true, but most of the time, lone pairs of electrons on your central atom. That is going to result in non polarity. So this can't happen until we get to the AX3 or AX4 cases at least, but you could have AX2E. Remember where that E is a lone pair of electrons. All right. So you could have A bonded to two X's and now have a lone pair of electrons. And you have lost the ability of that dipole moment to be canceled now. You essentially have the same structure going here. This has to retain this bent angle to it. And so now you have two dipole moments which are pointing, at least some component of them is pointing down. So the bottom end, as I've drawn it, of this molecule would be negative, and the top end would be positive. This could happen in the, uh, the tetrahedral family, AX3E, where like ammonia, the ammonia molecule, uh, but I'll, I'll continue to use X's, So if we take our tetrahedral structure and replace the top bond with a lone pair of electrons, again, now what we have, if we look at this molecule, if we imagine looking at it from underneath, we would be seeing these three X's facing us, and the A would be hidden. But then if we came up above and looked at it from here, now we see the A, and that's how I like to think about these molecules. It's like the signature difference. When I look at it from one side and then the other, do I see a different face of the molecule, so to speak? And that tells me that it's going to be a polar molecule. And, and again, it's pretty universal that if you have lone pairs, you're going to have a, a polar molecule. So our, you know, our, our work with Lewis structures is pretty important. Being able to quickly uh, analyze or write out a Lewis dot structure for a molecule, not even getting to this point, not getting the Vesper structure, but just realizing that A, X3, you know, when we draw its flat Lewis dot structure, has a lone pair of electrons on it. All right? And so, as a quick example, sulfur uh, tetrafluoride, SF4. Sulfur has six valence electrons on it. I like to do this with my fingers, right? Six valence electrons. Fluorine, owing to its position in the periodic table, needs to form one bond. So each of the four fluorines needs one electron from sulfur. All right. Well, uh, that means that there are, what, two electrons left that belong just to sulfur. So we've got a lone pair of electrons on the sulfur, and I can immediately conclude that SF4 is going to be a polar molecule. 
Mm -hmm. right? So with some practice and refreshing your memory on those Lewis dot structures, you'll quickly be able to decide whether there are lone pairs and whether or not that then means a polar or nonpolar molecule. Now the other instance that pretty universally leads to, not, uh, to polarity in a molecule, so the second uh, concept here, is um, having different exterior atoms. So if we have A, X, Y, right, where A is bonded to X on one side and Y on the other side, these are going to no longer be identical dipole moments. I said earlier five units to the left and five units to the right. Well now it might be seven units to the left and four units to the right. So that's seven units of negative charge to one side of our molecule and only four units to try to cancel to the other side. That's going to give us a net still dipole on the, the one side of the molecule. So this is going to happen anytime you have different elements on the outside of the molecule. Uh, it becomes harder to see in some of our three-dimensional cases because when we look at a, a molecule flat, like its Lewis dot structure, we might think that there's symmetry as well. So the most common instance of this uh, deceiving us is like an AX2, Y2. Uh, and so we might think that the Lewis dot structure of this molecule would look like this, you know? Or some people might draw it this way with the two X's here and the two Y's here. All right. The reality of this is though, the Lewis dot structure is kind of deceiving us because this molecule is not truly flat like the piece of paper or the board that I'm writing on, right? This molecule is three dimensional and no matter how you think you can put the pieces together, so say I did it this way for one. Okay, and let me swap these two right here. So you see I've switched the X and the Y. These are the same molecule. All I have to do is let's, uh, let's let my thumb represent the X. Okay, so we've kept an X on the top, so this is a common way to analyze whether structures are the same or the different. Uh, keeping one piece exactly the same, A bonded to X. So this A to X is my thumb. Index and middle fingers are the A to Y's. Are these the same? Well, if I twist this and bring my thumb out, I didn't have to disconnect my fingers. Yes, this really is the same. This molecule on the right is just this molecule seen from a different angle. Like looking at a house, straight on, or looking at it from a side street, okay? Uh, it's the same house, of course, you've just changed your perspective on the molecule. So all I've done to get from here to here is rotate the molecule. So obviously these are the same molecule, right? No matter how you might try to switch the X's and the Y's, you will always be able to bring it back to this orientation simply by rotating the molecule around. Th that working backwards then tells us that it doesn't matter which way we draw them um, on a flat piece of paper. Now, does this mean this molecule is polar or nonpolar? Well, this one's the easiest way to see it. There's a dividing line in this molecule now. Again, I, if I'm standing over here, I can see the two X's sticking towards me. But if you're standing on this side of the molecule or looking at it, you're confronted with the two Y's coming at you. And so there is clearly going to be a difference in the dipole moments and so this would be a, a polar molecule. Right? So again, lone pairs and different exterior atoms are the two most common ways that uh, we introduced uh, polarity into a structure. And symmetry is the way that we uh, get rid of that polarity and have non-polar molecules. All right. 
So our molecules come really in three different types to summarize where we've gotten to this point, okay? We want to label molecules as nonpolar, polar, or on the one extreme, ionic. Okay, if we make, a, if we make that, that bond so polar that the electrons are completely removed from one atom to the other, it becomes an ionic bond. Right? So that's our, our, what we're trying to do when we're presented with a molecule is decide, is this compound, this molecule, polar, nonpolar, or ionic? And in doing that, we will be able to assign then the different styles of intermolecular forces. So now we're ready to talk about what these intermolecular forces are. Because they are determined by the degree of polarity or ionic bond that's present in your molecule. Right? So I'm going to go from, uh, let's go from weakest to strongest. The weakest of our intermolecular forces is known as dispersion forces. Okay. Dispersion forces occur between two or more, but at least two, nonpolar molecules. All right, between two nonpolar molecules. All right. And it's a very weak uh, attraction because the molecules have no way of grabbing hold of one another, so to speak. All right. Um, it's the charges that allow us, these uh, dipole charges that I've referred to, that allow two molecules to stick to each other. All right. Earlier I mentioned pretzels versus gummy bears. Pretzels would be sort of analogous to dispersion forces. They're, 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 they're not sticking to each other. No, no way for them to grab hold of each other. Okay? Um, a slightly stronger form of uh, intermolecular force would be what's called a dipole-dipole force. Okay? The dipole-dipole force occurs between two polar molecules. Notice I've left a little room here. I'm going to fill in a few more things, some examples. And then if the uh, polarity becomes extreme, then we have the ionic, uh, not only the ionic bond, but the ionic intermolecular force. So this is what occurs in ionic compounds. Okay. Right. So now this goes from weakest to strongest. We'll have a couple others that we'll add to this list a little bit later on, but these are the three sort of parent uh, intermolecular forces that we want to focus on. Right. All right, let me show you what I mean by the dipole-dipole one, okay? So the way a dipole-dipole attraction works is to imagine, you know, a generic molecule, and that generic molecule has a positive and a negative end because it's a polar molecule. So when another one of these comes nearby, it's going to arrange itself so that we can get the attraction between the negative of one end of the molecule and the positive of the other. And then if we had another one, it might come in down here and it'll be flipped again so that the negative up here can be attracted to the positive down here. And this is going to give us a lot of favorable interaction between these two molecules. All right. The charges are a lot like you or I or anybody having hands that you can use to grab and hold on to other molecules. That's what these intermolecular forces are. They're sort of quantifying how one molecule can grab hold and touch or be in physical contact with other molecules. All right. 
And so dipole, polar molecules, are really good at this. And that's why a lot of them are liquids and even solids in many cases, right? Because they have these favorable means of attaching to one another, clustering together. So these charges are kind of like you know, the stickiness of a gummy bear, that, that outside, how it'll stick to another gummy bear pretty well, okay? On the other hand, our nonpolar molecules, they lack those charges in them. And so a nonpolar molecule has no charge, right? So there's really no way for it to reach out and grab a hold of the other molecule. All right, and so these things often end up being gases, things that have dispersion forces, because they have little to no ability to hold on to each other, to cluster together and form a, literally form a clump of molecules that you would see as a liquid or as a solid, all right? But nevertheless, they do come together sometimes due to what's called an induced dipole. An induced dipole is a temporary okay, dipole that develops on a nonpolar molecule. I use M slash C for molecule there, and I'll use that occasionally. Okay. Uh, the, the way I like to think about these induced dipoles, I'll tell you a little story. Sometimes I end up taking uh, my children to the grocery store with me. And, you know, if you've ever hung around kids who are six, eight, ten years old, right, uh, they're interested in grabbing a lot of stuff off the shelves at a store, whether it's the grocery store or any other kind of store. So uh, when my kids are particularly wound up, I need to tell them, hey, Put your hands in your pockets, right? And that's when they're essentially like one of these nonpolar molecules. They lack these charges or their, their means by which they can grab something because I force them to have their, their hands in their, in their coat pockets or their pant pockets when they're walking down you know, the aisle with all the glass jars that I'm worried about them breaking, right? But every now and then, Something might be just so irresistible, right, that one of them takes their hand out of their pocket, all right, and just has to reach out and grab it. So temporarily, they've become like a polar molecule. They've got a, a hand that sort of can reach out and, and grab something. And, you know, if my son does this, of course my daughter doesn't want to feel left out, so she feels like she can take her hand out and grab something, right? And it sort of cascades this effect of one molecule having it, one child having his hands out, cascades to the other child wanting to do that as well. In molecules, this becomes a game of like hot potato, all right? This charge can be induced by something on the outside, but it can also just happen uh, by random chance. Maybe my son forgets, just accidentally his hand comes out of his pocket. He's not paying attention, he's not concentrating. Nobody forced him to take it out, but his hand comes out of his pocket. In these molecules, all of the electrons that we have, they you know, might evenly be distributed one moment, but then the next moment, because of the motion of those electrons, you have too many electrons on one side of the molecule. And in that moment, that's when you've got your induced dipole present. And you've got these temporary, very small dipole, partial dipole charges that can be used to, to cluster these molecules together. All right. Um, so it can just happen by random chance. And that's why we call it an induced dipole. The other way it happens is, uh, again, to sort of borrow from my, my children, right? If we have a different molecule that has a permanent dipole on it, like this, right? So say I've only asked my son to have his hands in his pockets because he's been a little fidgety or something today, but my daughter's been well behaved, so I, I let her walk around with her hands out. Well, that's a recipe for disaster in my family because she always has her charges out, and so she's gonna 
whatever, tease, or she's going to be showing off that I can grab stuff on the shelf. And, and the presence of the polar near the nonpolar, this, you know, imagine there's sort of these waves of sort of this negative charge coming out. That's going to move all of these electrons away. They're going to want to get away from that like negative charge and this blue molecule will now become loaded again with negative on one side. So again we have, here's the real case where we have sort of induced or forced that dipole to develop on the nonpolar molecule. Right? Now these are two different molecules, so this type of interaction is going to occur in a mixture, all right, of, of two different substances. Uh, and I'll come back to listing out what some of the mixed intermolecular forces are later, all right. But this is in essence what a dispersion force is. It's so weak because it's only relying on these really transient, temporary induced dipoles. That's the, um, the most that we can get to try to hold them together. But our dipole molecules, they have these permanent, albeit tiny, partial charges on each other and they can grab hold of one another pretty easily and, and cluster together. And that means they can form liquids and they can form solids, all right? Because those are the phases where molecules are literally touching one another, liquids and solids. And the ionic is just an even greater exaggeration of this polar uh, case because the charges are much larger and the molecules just hold together even more tightly in, in the case of the ionic, all right? All right, we have some special cases to consider and we have some of the mixtures to consider as well. So let's talk about some of the, the mixtures first. They're quick and easy, all right? Uh, mixtures, you know, this, these involve two different substances. Now, each with its own um, intermolecular force, or each being polar or maybe being nonpolar. All right. So some of the some of the things that exist in mixtures, we can have what's called a dipole induced dipole intermolecular force. This would occur between a polar and a nonpolar substance. Okay, so uh, this is actually so the analogy of where I let one of my children have their hands out, that's a polar, and then the, the child who had to have their hands in their pockets would be a nonpolar. Right? So if we try to mix those two together, what's going to try to hold them to one another is the polar molecules inducing those temporary dipoles on the nonpolar molecules so that they can, can try to grab together. So if you put pretzels into your bag of gummy bears, right, you would, the stickiness of the pretzels might kind of rub, sorry, the stickiness of the gummy bears might, you know, kind of rub off on the pretzels and let the pretzels stick in to that, that mix, if you can imagine, all right? So that's one form of a mixture that we can have. Um, we can have the dipole-dipole in a mixture. This would just be two different polar substances. Okay, so they both have those positive and negative charges, they just happen to be different compounds. So they'll, they'll stick together pretty well or mix very well. All right, um, and then we can have the ion dipole mixture. All right, this is a really strong, favorable interaction because it occurs between an ionic compound plus a polar compound or substance. Kind of using substance and compound interchangeably here, but that's fair, fair use in this case. All right? The ionic compound has very large uh, positive and negative charges on its molecule, on its ions actually, and then the polar compound would have uh, the uh, partial charges, and so it's a good matchup. This 
uh, intermolecular force of attraction is responsible for why so many things dissolve in water. Water is a very polar compound and many, many salts, as you learned in Chem 1, you learned your solubility rules, um, dissolve into water because you get a very favorable interaction between the positive ions of like sodium chloride, so the positive sodium, and the negative end of water, oxygen. And you get an interaction between the negative end of sodium chloride, Cl, and the positive end of water, the hydrogen. So you get a, a double interaction and it's going to be very favorable for letting the two dissolve or come together, mix together. All right. So these are some of the uh, ones that occur in mixtures. All right. There's one other form of intermolecular force that I want to talk about. Then I'm going to do some examples for it. Uh, and this is a very important category. It's what's called the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a type of intermolecular force. It's not a type of bond, even though it's got the word bond in it. It's a type of intermolecular force that occurs in substances that have hydrogen attached or bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay? This scenario of an H bonded to a nitrogen, H bonded to oxygen, or H bonded to F, these three dipole moments, right, all of which would point from the hydrogen to the more electronegative nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, these are essentially the three largest dipole moments that we can get. Okay, So they're sort of like a dipole moment on steroids, right? They're really beefed up. So they're big. They're almost this, you know, the difference between this end and this end of this bond is almost like an ionic bond actually. Not quite, but it's really close. And the effect of this is that it, it really amplifies, magnifies, right? Remember, it intensifies the dipole-dipole attraction. Okay? And, and as a result, it enhances or changes the properties of substances that display it. Okay? Water is the, you know, the biggest example of something that demonstrates, displays hydrogen bonding. It's got two of these very uneven, you know, polar bonds present in it, uh, both of which are pointing at the oxygen end. So you've got a very negative end there and a very positive end here. So when one water is introduced to another, the attraction is great. And, and it's uh, like a super, super sticky set of gummy bears. All right? um, and that's going to result in those water molecules really wanting to hold tightly to each other. Now compare this to H2S. H2S still has the same shape as water, but what's different is the dipole moments are much smaller in that case. Smaller dipole moment. So there's going to be a weaker attraction between one H2S and another H2S compared to the attraction between one water and another water. All right? Weaker dipole moments means weaker attraction. Right? And it's just a special case when hydrogen's attached to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine that we get this amplified attraction and thus these molecules want to hold together to each other more tightly. All right? 
Now in order to do hydrogen bonding you have to be able to both donate and receive and when I do some of the examples in a minute I'll show you what I mean by that, okay? But that'll be, that'll be an important part, okay? But some of the properties that really get affected are uh, melting and boiling. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure where the uh, camera uh, quit out on the uh, last segment there, but we were talking about this hydrogen bonding effect, and it's a, a very significant uh, phenomenon that causes the properties to deviate of a substance from what might otherwise be predicted. These two molecules, again, water and hydrogen sulfide, because of their shapes, should demonstrate really similar properties. But this amplified dipole moment that exists on these OH bonds really causes water molecules to tightly attach or <coughs> adhere to one another. And so pulling those apart from each other then, which is what the boiling point is really all about, is a lot harder. Thus the boiling point is extremely exaggerated for water versus where it would be without the effect of hydrogen bonding. It's a good one to two hundred degrees higher. It actually water would be boiled well below zero degrees Celsius were it not for hydrogen bonding. There's a trend that we can look at, an image in your textbook uh, figure that shows that. Um, and the density, the density is much more enhanced as well. And this is part of the reason why ice, solid water, floats in liquid water. Most other solid materials, their solid is the, the more dense phase compared to the liquid. Uh, I erased the pictures that I had up here earlier, but in the liquid phase our molecules usually pool apart from each other a little bit. They have that more degree of freedom of motion. But in water, the hydrogen bonding really snaps the molecules tightly together. To form the solid phase, the molecules have to arrange, they have to come up with a pattern, a regular repeating pattern. Perhaps you've seen you know, close-up images of a snowflake or an ice crystal, right? So the molecules have to move out to make that pattern that introduces more space between them, thus the density is decreased because you have the same mass but now in a larger volume, uh, that's going to be a lower, less dense subphase. That's why ice floats on top of, of uh, water. Very different world, right, if ice didn't float actually, if, if uh, lakes and ponds and things froze from the bottom up, right? It would be very different if it weren't for this hydrogen bonding phenomenon. Okay. All right. We're ready to do some examples now so that we can assign the intermolecular force of attraction. Oh, left my pen off camera here. I'll be right back. There we go. So let's, let's identify, I like to ask the question in this manner. Identify the strongest intermolecular force present. Right? And I'll tell you why I asked the question that way in, in just a second. Right? So if we were considering um, what we uh, molecule that I put up earlier, SF4. For SF4, the, the, the logic process that we need to go to to assign the strongest intermolecular force present here, first we would need that Lewis dot structure that we uh, drew up earlier. So real quick, we can throw up a Lewis dot structure. We see this lone pair of electrons, so we would say this is a polar molecule. Because it's a polar molecule, we know it's got a slightly positive and a slightly negative side to it. And that's what's going to allow one SF4 to attract to another. So we would say that dipole-dipole attractions exist and they're the strongest of the forces. Okay? Here, up here in this right hand corner of the board, I'll list now from strongest down to weakest. Ionic, ion dipole, H bond, hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole, dipole induced dipole, and then dispersion. Okay? 
So dipole dipole is right about the middle. The reality of this molecule, SF4, is that it actually also possesses dispersion forces, all right? Uh, we could think of these as like a ladder, especially when we write them in this direction, right? And that every substance has as a minimum dispersion forces, and then you would work your way up the ladder. Well, SF4 cannot have dipole-induced dipole because it's not a mixture, right? Uh, the SF4 molecules all have dipoles, so we kind of cross that out in this case, and then we can go up to dipole-dipole, and it's not capable of hydrogen bonding, so that's all the further up this ladder that we would, we would go, all right? Um, the book and Mastering Chemistry asks you to list all of the intermolecular forces present, so you have to list out several. So for SF4, you would say dispersion and dipole-dipole. Again, I, I like to simplify it and just say, tell me how far up that ladder, what's the strongest intermolecular force that you're going to see demonstrated in a substance, okay? All right, how about carbon dioxide, CO2? Uh, a quick Lewis dot structure for this molecule, okay? Two double bonds from the carbon to the two oxygens, all right? Uh, don't worry about the lone pairs on the oxygens. Lone pairs are on the central atom that we're worrying about. This molecule is symmetric, right? So there are dipoles pointing to each oxygen. This is just like AX2, which we saw a long time ago in this video, but that's where we started. So because it's symmetric, it's nonpolar. So what's going to try to hold one of these to another one of these would be the dispersion force. That's all that we can have in this case, dispersion forces. Right. How about uh, sulfur dioxide? Looks like it's going to be the same as carbon dioxide, SO2 to CO2, but we have to, this is why we have to be careful about our Lewis dot structures. Sulfur has two more electrons on it than carbon, and it's going to cause this to be a bent structure, actually. Again, I'm seeing it flat, and you can draw your bonds at whatever angles you want, but you have to remember, in reality, this molecule is going to have these two oxygens slightly pointed down. They're going to come out to one side, so you're looking at my hand's representing the two oxygens right now, and then if I turn around, now you're looking at the sulfur. So you are clearly going to have a polar molecule here because you're seeing different sides because of that lone pair of electrons. So this is going to have dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. <laughs> Sodium bromide, NaBr, all right? Uh, NaBr, uh, hopefully, you know, if you start polishing up your skills again, shouldn't take you any time at all to realize, ah, wait a minute, that's an ionic compound because it's got a metal in it, all right? Uh, remember the periodic table has the line on it, a red stepwise line starting right around aluminum in the upper right side that steps down to the bottom right hand corner that divides all the periodic table on the left side as metals and then the fewer smaller group of nonmetals on the right of that line. Anytime you cross that line and grab something from each side of it, you've got an ionic compound as far as we're concerned, all right? Uh, so if it's ionic compound, ionic intermolecular force of attraction would be present, okay? Let's look at uh, methanol, CH3OH, all right? I don't need to look any further in the case of methanol than the OH that's present right there. When we write a structure's formula this way, as opposed to CH4O, we're being given a big gift. This is telling us that we have O directly attached to H. If we were given the, this formula, the version here, we would have to maybe figure that out. But right away we see O attached to H. We know it's superpolar. Actually, we go even further and we know that this is going to exhibit hydrogen bonding. Let's look at a couple cases of mixtures and see how they come into play. Okay. 
What if we tried to mix uh, fluorine, F2, and how about uh, SO2? I chose SO2 because we already know that it's polar, right? Well, F2, hopefully it won't take you long. This is like we started earlier, X to X, right? The two fluorine atoms are going to have the same electronegativity. Uh, therefore, it's going to be a nonpolar bond. Uh, and this is a nonpolar molecule. So the attraction that exists between a polar and a nonpolar substance will be the dipole-induced dipole. Okay, dipole induced dipole attraction. Right? It's not going to be the greatest of mixtures here. Um, and we have this adage, this old adage that likes dissolve likes very well. Things of similar intermolecular force dissolve in one another very well because they have, they all have the same ability to grab hold of one another. Either they all have their hands out in the case of polar molecules or they all don't have their hands out in the case of nonpolar molecules. All right? So that's the, where that adage comes from. All right? How about, uh, let's continue with this SO2 and CH3OH. Now SO2, again, we assigned polar earlier. H, uh, CH3OH, we said, had hydrogen bonding. But in the case of SO2, let me draw it this way. Oops, sorry. I'm going to draw the oxygens pointing towards sort of the uh, methanol group. Okay. It's tempting to say that we could have what we're looking for. Uh, because hydrogen bonding in reality, and I did not draw this accurately earlier for you, that's when the video expired. Uh, hydrogen bond is really the uh, H of 1 attached or drawn to the O or nitrogen of another. So this dotted line right here is the H bond. And, and that's why you need to be able to both donate and receive. We can see that, yeah, this H could be attracted to this O right here, all right? But there, there's no um, H's on SO2 to reciprocate to the oxygen on methanol. So it's sort of, we need, we need to have to be able to give and receive in order to call the attraction hydrogen bonding. So in this case, um, while methanol to itself would be hydrogen bonding, we want to remember that hydrogen bonding is just an extreme form of this molecule being polar. So it sort of defaults back to the more generic polar uh, molecule, and we've got polar polar, so this mixture would be held together by the dipole-dipole intermolecular attraction. The same thing would be true if we tried to take our sodium bromide, our NaBr, and put it into water. Sodium bromide was ionic, we had earlier. Water can exhibit H bonds, but there are no hydrogens or oxygens over here on sodium bromide to participate in hydrogen bonding to the water. All right? So we can't have hydrogen bonding across these two different species and we'll treat uh, water in this case as being polar. So this is the ion dipole attraction that we have listed up here. So that's the strongest attraction that we can get in this circumstance. Right? So that's a nice list of, of examples for you to consider. In Blackboard for the course, you should find a worksheet that has many more of these intermolecular forces of attraction for you to consider. I'm going to wrap up this video on inter intermolecular forces. I can see it's been going on for, for quite a while. Thanks for your uh, patience and your participation in watching this outside of class time. There's going to be another video available where I go into uh, the topic of vaporization of liquids and what's called vapor pressure. And you'll need to watch that one before our next class uh, lecture as well. So thanks a lot. Take a little break and then come on back for the next video.